Hello, my name is Olu Agilori and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And today it's my pleasure to talk to you about a paper that I wrote with a colleague about the stress of racism, neuroinflammation, and COVID-19. Here are my disclosures. Most of the work I've done has been funded by NIMH um, and there are no conflicts of interest in this presentation. By way of overview, I'll be starting off with a discussion of health disparities and some of the social determinants of health as it relates to COVID-19. Then we'll talk a little bit about the biological sequelae of racism, as well as the neuropsychiatric sequelae of COVID-19. And then I'll end with some ways that uh, some institutions are trying to address some of these health inequities. So over the last year, there have been a number of headlines highlighting some of the racial disparities with COVID-19 highlighting that Black Americans face elevated rates of infection, that they're disproportionately dying from COVID-19, and that they're having a harder time with the recovery from the pandemic. This is something that I talked about last spring when we were dealing with the twin stressors of COVID-19, as well as social unrest related to uh, the George Floyd killing and other in such incidents. And what COVID-19 did was um, reveal some health disparities that have been present for a very long time. And some of those health disparities as it relates to COVID-19 um, were highlighted by a recent uh, study done by the Epic Health Research Network that showed disproportionate rates of death and hospitalization for black patients, suggesting that they, their rates were 24.6 and 5.6 per 10,000 uh, and it was even higher for Hispanic patients at 30.4 for hospitalization and 5.6 per 10,000 in terms of death rates. And then for Asian patients, it was 15.9 and 4.3 compared to white patients, which was the lowest group at 7.4 for their hospitalization rates and 2.3 for their death rates. And here in Chicago, uh, back in the spring of 2020, it was noted that while black Chicagoans were 30 percent of the population, they were nearly 40 percent of COVID cases um, and 50 percent of deaths. And what are some of the contributors to these racial disparities? Well, there's some biological considerations. For example, the angiotensin converting enzyme type 2 is the entry receptor for COVID-19. And there's some evidence of racial differences in the expression and activity of ACE2 that might contribute to increased risk of severe illness when contracting COVID-19 in African Americans. Second, there's disproportionate rates of cardiovascular disease, which is a known risk factor for a more complicated course of COVID-19. And then of course, there are socially determinate factors which play a really important role. For example, economic factors, uh, for example, uh, patients uh, from uh, communities of color are more likely to have essential jobs uh, that force them to be out in public during the pandemic, as well as unstable housing that might have made it difficult to stay in quarantine in place. And then also um, public transportation put them at greater exposure of contracting COVID-19. Then there are environmental exposures. There's a suggestion that even things like um, pollutants or um, poor air quality is worse uh, in areas where there are high concentrations of um, uh, ethnic minorities uh, contributing to greater risk factors for worsening outcomes with COVID-19. And then of course there's uh, medical bias uh, in testing uh, as well as treatment. And this was something that was highlighted the case of Dr. Susan Moore, who uh, published a video diary on Facebook when she uh, contracted COVID-19 and was hospitalized. Um, and she posted in this diary that on November 29th of 2020, she had tested positive. And she said that her respiratory rate was in the 30s, heart rate was in the 150s, and she had a fever of 101.5. She says, I had to beg to get the remdesivir because Dr. Banner said my chest x-ray was normal. I then had to beg for a CT of my chest, which I finally got, and it showed a large mediastinal lymphadenopathy 
right lower lobe infiltrate and a new left lower lobe infiltrate. She finally got two infusions of the remdesivir and Dr. Bannock said, I don't qualify. I'm not short of breath. He doesn't know why my neck hurts and he doesn't feel comfortable giving me any narcotics. She said, all I can do is cry. I was in so much pain. He said, you could just go home right now. Of note, he did not even listen to my lungs. He didn't touch me in any way. He performed no physical exam. I told him, you cannot tell me how I feel. Next thing I know, STAT CT angiogram was ordered for my neck, which showed new infiltrates in my lungs superiorly and a new pleural effusion since December 1st, in addition to new mediastinal lymphadenopathy. Next thing I know, I'm getting a phone call saying, what can we get you for your pain? She says, why do I have to prove that there's something wrong with me in order for my pain to be treated? I have informed the patient advocate. Of note, she also stated that she felt that she was getting this treatment because she was black. She felt that if she was a white patient, her needs would have been better attended to. Unfortunately, a week after that hospitalization, she passed away from COVID-19 and her mistreatment uh, was highlighted in the New York Times last December. And so not only we are seeing um, medical bias in terms of uh, testing and treatment for COVID-19, um, but now in the wake of vaccination, we're seeing that there's a racial divide in terms of who's receiving vaccination. And at first this was attributed to increased rates of vaccine hesitancy in the black community, but it's not just um, vaccine hesitancy, it's also access to vaccines. Um, for example, if you don't have good Wi-Fi or internet, it might be difficult for you to book an appointment to get a vaccine. And so there are efforts to pay attention to these disparities in vaccine access, uh, which I'll talk about uh, towards the end of the talk. All right, so why do these social inequities persist despite evidence of their deleterious effects on health? And one of the clear reasons is structural racism, uh, which can be defined as practices that are embedded in an institution um, that contributes to or creates unequal opportunities or outcomes by race. And the key is that these are practices that are so embedded in the institution that they seem to be normal. And this is in contrast to interpersonal racism, um, which plays a, a role, but it's not as big of a factor as structural racism. And this structural racism also has biological consequences. Uh, for example, uh, the experiences of racism have been shown to have the same biological effects as any other kind of persistent chronic stressor. And that relates to things like altered HPA axis function which can um, lead to increased levels of cortisol, which has deleterious effects for the brain. Um, metabolic changes and associated medical comorbidities. So things like type two diabetes, hypertension, and asthma can result from the stress of racism. And then there have even been studies that show that there's pre evidence of premature cellular aging in terms of shortened telomeres associated with increased exposure to uh, stressful uh, racist events or experiences of discrimination. And then um, there are studies that also show alterations in immune function associated with experiences of racism. And I'll go into that a little bit more in the next slide. So one of the ways to measure these alterations in immune function uh, was developed by uh, Dr. Stephen Cole at UCLA. And he came up with something called conserved transcriptional response to adversity, which describes a pattern of transcriptional alterations that are activated by chronic sympathetic nervous system activity or stress. And this pattern reflects an increase in genes related to inflammation and a decrease in genes related to innate immunity. And the CTRA was studied uh, by my colleague, April Thames, in a cohort of African-American and Caucasian patients with HIV. And what she found is that the African-American patients relative to the Caucasian counterparts had elevated levels of transcription of um, genes associated with inflammation, AP1 and NF-kappa B, 
as well as an increase in genes related to the stress response, CREB and the glucocorticoid receptor. And these increases in transcription in inflama inflammatory genes as well as stress-related genes were partially reduced if you controlled for experiences of discrimination. And this is something that's been um, well characterized in the context of depression, where there's an inflammatory hypothesis of depression that posits that increases in these pro-inflammatory cytokines are related to the pathophysiology of major depression. And these increases in pro-inflammatory cytokines have a number of effects on things like a decrease in uh, neurotransmitters associated with depression, a decrease in neurotrophic factors, as well as increased excitotoxicity, um, which can be deleterious for the brain. And this is something that we studied in our own lab um, in a group of patients with depression compared to controls. And we looked at uh, three different cytokines as well as a composite measure called a cytokine index. And across the board, uh, looking at IL-6, TNF-alpha, and IL-1-beta, uh, patients with depression had elevated levels of these pro-inflammatory cytokines, which fits in very well with what has been previously described in the literature. So in, in the wake of what we had seen uh, last year in terms of racial disparities of COVID-19 and April's work showing how discrimination is related to altered immune function, we wanted to re-examine the relationship between these pro-inflammatory cytokines and depressions stratifying our sample by race. We had 46 of our patients that were African-American, 21 uh, comparison subjects with 25 with depression, and 75 were, were Caucasian, 34 healthy comparison subjects, and 41 with uh, major depression. And we looked at those um, same cytokines, and we adjusted uh, any group differences by factors that could be possible confounds like age, education, hemoglobin A1C, uh, body mass index, as well as diastolic uh, blood pressure. And what we found was that uh, if you look at um, levels of CRP and IL-6, we found that if uh, you looked at the participants without depression, our black participants had significantly higher levels of CRP and higher levels of IL-6 compared to their white counterparts. And this racial difference was completely eliminated in the context of depression. Another way to look at it is that if you look at our uh, Caucasian participants, you see the characteristic increase in levels of CRP and increase in IL-6 associated with depression. And we did not see this in our black uh, participants where there was no increase associated with depression. So the relationship between elevations in these pro-inflammatory markers and depression was moderated by race. Another way of looking at this is looking at this correlation plot of depression severity against IL-6 levels. And uh, we see that the correlation between depression severity and IL-6 was significant in our white participants, but not significant in our black participants. So the normal relationship or the characteristic relationship between depression and pro-inflammatory cytokines was driven by the white participants. And so what this shows is that the well-known relationship between pro-inflammatory cytokines was moderated by race, and it was moderated by race due to the high baseline levels of these pro-inflammatory markers in our African-American participants. And so what we're doing now in this sample is to see whether these elevations at baseline may be related to stressful life events secondary to discriminatory experiences. So now switching gears, I wanna to touch base a little bit on some of the neuropsychiatric sequela of uh, COVID-19. Um, it's estimated to affect over 30% of patients that are hospitalized with COVID, and it's characterized by a wide range of heterogeneous neuropsychiatric symptoms, including memory loss, impaired concentration, uh, mood symptoms like depression, anxiety, delirium, and even psychosis. 
and it's increasingly considered a key feature of long COVID or what is now known as post-acute symptoms of COVID or PASC. Um, and those have been characterized by things like fatigue, cognitive difficulties, or um, described by patients as brain fog. And some of the putative mechanisms for the neuropsychiatric sequelae um, are related to both a direct pathway, which is secondary to the cytokine, cytokine storm that can occur with COVID-19, leading to neuroinflammation and contributing to encephalopathies, depression, as well as symptoms of PTSD. And then the indirect pathway, um, otherwise known as the fourth wave of the pandemic. So in the wake of quarantine, lockdown, social isolation, we're seeing increased rates of anxiety and depression. And this has been um, described by Victor Tseng um, in this uh, graph showing the different waves of a pandemic. And the fourth wave, which is the prolonged effects of the pandemic, relate to mental illness, economic injury, burnout, psychological trauma, which we're seeing now. And that's been evidenced by a couple of recent papers in the literature showing that uh, the prevalence of depressive symptoms has increased nearly threefold in U.S. adults pre and post pandemic. Uh, there was another study that looked at uh, health behaviors uh, and the effects of stay at home orders on those health behaviors and showed a significant increase in anxiety symptoms reported by patients. And then even as the uh, pandemic now is um, fading and people are returning back to work, there's reports of increased anxiety about returning to quote unquote back to normal. So I just wanna end with um, a couple possible solutions to some of um, these inequities that have been instituted by various um, uh, hospitals and, and programs throughout the country. And, and these highlight the fact that structural problems uh, like institutional or structural racism need structural solutions. Um, and one of those is expanding access to healthcare. Um, there was a, a viewpoint that was published earlier this year in JAMA where they talked about some of the racial and ethnic health disparities associated with COVID-19 and um, expanding access to healthcare was one of the first things that they mentioned. Um, and this is one of the things that is happening here in Chicago. So in order to address um, some of the inequities in the rollout of the vaccine program, uh, Lori Lightfoot uh, worked with a data analysis company to develop something called the Chicago COVID-19 Community Vulnerability Index. And what this index is, is it takes into account different vulnerability factors, uh, socio-demographic factors, epidemiological ones, occupational factors, as well as the cumulative COVID burden to come up with an index uh, for each part of the city. And as an example for the socio-demographic uh, factors, they take into account things like level of unemployment, per capita income, education level, um, the housing status, uh, and access to a primary care provider. And what they did was they characterized all the different zip codes in the city of Chicago according to this um, CCVI uh, into low, medium, and high risk uh, regions, depending on the level of their index. And they identified um, several neighborhoods where regardless of your health status, regardless of what phase the state was in in terms of the vaccine rollout, if you lived in a designated zip code, you had special access uh, to the vaccine. Now this program just started at the end of February, so it might be a little bit too early to see if uh, this moved the needle in terms of dealing with some of the disparities in the vaccine rollout but at least this was a data-driven approach to dealing with some of these inequities. The other thing that's mentioned is establishing equitable care models. And this is something um, that Mass General Brigham rolled out uh, late last year, where they had a 10-point structural equity plan. Um, and included in this plan, um, was basically, if you look at initiative two, was a reporting plan for incidents of discrimination and racism. And they instituted this by taking advantage 
of systems that were already in place in the hospital for reporting things like adverse events, medical errors. So that same reporting system that everybody is familiar with who works in a hospital could be used to report incidents of racism between a staff and a patient, patient and staff, staff to staff or patient to patient. And by basically monitoring these events of racism, then they could identify where the problem points were and come up with a structural way to address them. Uh, the third thing mentioned by this article is addressing some of the social determinants of health. And this is something um, that was done in a pilot program here at UIC called Better Housing Through Health, where um, if there were patients that were uh, coming to the ED all the time and they were identified to be chronically homeless, um, then they would be set up with permanent housing um, because oftentimes when uh, these patients would show up to the ED repeatedly, um, it might be because of their unstable housing and not necessarily because of uh, medical issues that they were showing up for medical care to actually address what was um, a housing problem. And so the idea is that it might be more cost effective to actually provide stable housing for these patients than to repeatedly have them come in through the ED, get evaluated, perhaps get um, hospitalized. So this is a way of dealing with some of the social or structural determinants of health. Um, so I just wanna conclude by mentioning that some of the um, uh, uh, data that I mentioned, some of the work uh, was cited uh, from a paper that I published last year called The Fire This Time, The Stress of Racism, Inflammation and COVID-19. Um, you're welcome to check it out in Brain Behavior and Immunity uh, to read more. And I thank you very much for your attention. Bye.